All right, Lev Dmitrievich, here we go. It's December of 1999. What is the state of Russia at the time? The situation was actually was very grave. But there were certain signs of turning for the better. The economics of Russia started growing before Mr. Putin became president. So the situation was quite difficult in the country, but I cannot agree with those who say that Mr. Putin assumed Russia when it was in a disastrous situation. There was not a disaster. The economy was growing. The budget of 1999 was uh, with no shortages, was a surplus one. There was no second war in Chechnya. And generally speaking, all the regions subordinated to the federal center, so they actually, the country was resuscitating. So did you know uh, Vladimir Putin? Uh, had you met him? Uh, what was he like? What was your impression of him? For quite a while, I knew Mr. Putin then, before he became the president. I got acquainted with him in April 1995 when he was first deputy governor of St. Petersburg. We had a conversation in his office in the small palace in St. Petersburg. He gave a very good impression then. He gave an impression of a man who is actually well intended, uh, with good manners, well brought up. He could listen to other people. And another important thing, very important thing. Then, when I knew him before his presidency, and I knew him for four years already, and we met from time to time because of uh, the call of duty, he always, always uh, actually kept his word. I remember there was some party meeting, and we were members of the same political organization, uh, which was called Our House is Russia, or Our Home is Russia. And he was then uh, uh, head of the executive office of the president, or director of FSB, and our parliamentary faction had three or four requests, very specific ones, very exact ones. Mr. Putin had his notebook with him, a famous one, and always he carries this notebook with him all the time. And he made bullet points, one, two, three, four. And within two or three days, he actually did everything. But I remembered one impression from that time. When Mr. Putin was appointed to acting prime minister, it was August 1999. He came to the State Duma, was a deputy, and MP then, and this was a chamber meeting dedicated to the situation in Chechnya. All the leaders of the faction uh, spoke out and criticized the government. And I was the leader of the faction, and I also spoke out and I also criticized the government. So, in fact, I criticized the work of Mr. Putin. And then an interesting thing happened. When all the leaders of factions took the floor, Mr. Putin came to the rostrum with his notebook, and started point by point answering, responding to our criticism. And at that moment, in August 1999, I, for the first time, saw an absolutely different person. He was very emotional. He was very rigid, very tough. He was very angry, actually. And he shouted at us, at me, and he said, what the hell are you saying? You do not understand what you're speaking about. What are all you speaking about? You do not understand what you're speaking about. And then I realized that this person is much more sophisticated than I thought of him. And then he actually showed, he disclosed that he has this force, this aggression, and even angriness, anger. And that is a very different person than uh, Boris Yeltsin 
uh, must have known about, uh, and very different person than the Russian people knew about? I do think that, though, for Boris Yeltsin, everything mattered. First of all, it mattered what I have just mentioned. Mr. Putin, when he says, I will do, he means it, and he will do it. And in Russian, we call it um, just uh, following your words, living by your words. And this was factor number one. And if Mr. Putin promised to Mr. Yeltsin to keep uh, Kasyanov as uh, the prime minister, to warranty uh, safety and security of his family, and I do think there were more conditions, more terms, and Putin said, I will do that. And if you pay attention to that, he kept all his words given to Mr. Yeltsin's family. They live comfortably. Yeltsin's daughters, grandchildren, they kept their property. And moreover, Mr. Putin built an enormous museum dedicated to Yeltsin in Urals. An enormous one, a huge one. So this way, Mr. Putin, from his viewpoint, actually fulfilled all the items of his uh, promises given to Yeltsin, and it was very important for Yeltsin. Secondly, I do think that Yeltsin felt that uh, Mr. Uh, Putin has guts, and uh, I do think that this was another factor why Yeltsin opted for Putin. Yeltsin, when he left his office on December 31st, 1999, he was in his winter coat and winter hat. He came to the steps of the palace and it was December and it was very frosty. And next to him you could see Mr. Putin and uh, Yeltsin shook his hand and uh, this is the footage which uh, actually the whole world said and Yeltsin said, take care of Russia. Just two words, take care of Russia. I do think that uh, Yeltsin saw Putin as a person who, first of all, would keep his word, his promise given to Yeltsin personally, item by item, and he saw Mr. Putin as a very strong person who would preserve Russia, who would save Russia. I do think that these two factors actually mattered, and he absolutely trusted Mr. Putin. So, it sounds a, a little bit like... Uh, Yeltsin's uh, perspective on Putin uh, are mirrored when Putin meets President George W. Bush for the first time, and Bush says he looked through his eyes and into his soul. When you heard Bush say that, uh, how did you hear it, and, and what was your reaction? You know, when I heard these words, I believed them. Because my personal experience of communicating to Putin since 1995 through 1999 was absolutely pleasant. And I was 100% sure that uh, he will do more reforms, that he is a reformist. And uh, I was absolutely sure that Putin is a Democrat because he supported Boris Yeltsin. He was first deputy and right hand of Mr. Sobchak, the mayor of St. Petersburg. Anatoly Sobchak is the most renowned our Democrat. How could such a great Democrat work with a bad person? We all were sure that Mr. Putin is a representative of our political camp, that he is a liberal and he is a reformist. So everything was absolutely great. But I know a different thing too. I know that several years afterwards, Boris Yeltsin, to a certain extent, uh, got disappointed uh, with uh, his choice. And uh, Boris Nemtsov told me about that. 
которым я дружил. And so we were friends, me and Mr. Nemtsov. He met Boris Yeltsin. And uh, the latter was very much disappointed and was very frustrated with certain decisions taken by Mr. Putin. And the most important thing or moment, and uh, Yeltsin was a pensioner, was a retired person at the time. He was at his dacha, at his country house, uh, near Moscow, Roblevka Avenue, but suddenly he watched TV and he actually monitored what is going on in the country. And he started disagreeing with Mr. Putin internally. It was in 2003 when Khodorkovsky was detained, was arrested. At that moment, Boris Yeltsin realized that this is an absolutely different politics. This is not his politics. This is not the politics when the television is absolutely free, when business can work freely. When Khodorkovsky could freely work with American companies, yes, Yeltsin chose Mr. Putin. But several years after, Yeltsin realized that this is an absolutely different politics. This is the politics which destroys to much extent what Yeltsin had created in 1993, early 1990s, so freedom of speech, federalism, democracy, private property, and free market. But Yeltsin was isolated. He didn't make any public speeches. And there were just two or three interviews of Mr. Yeltsin, which were taken quite cautiously in a very diplomatic language. But between the lines, so to say, between the words, you could read certain disappointment with what was going on in the country. How were the Russian people responding to what Putin uh, was doing? I know his, his argument is... Uh, Russians need and want a powerful, decisive leader. They've needed it and uh, someone who will stand up to the world and gain respect for Russia, and that that was who he intended to be. You know, the history very often plays bad jokes with us. And um, history is not very fair with us. For instance, Michael Gorbachev. From my point of view, he is one of the best leaders in the history of my country. He is a person of exceptional honesty, humanism and uh, he is a person who did for Russia and for the world so much good that probably no other person in the history did. But most of Russians just hate him. I mean Michael Gorbachev. Why this happened? Michael Gorbachev is not the one to be blamed. He is not guilty of that when he became the leader of the Soviet Union, an economic crisis took place, that the oil price uh, fell fourfold, and the Soviet Union was left with no money. Michael Gorbachev could not influence the oil prices. Uh, the Saudi sheikhs actually were the ones to influence it, not Michael Gorbachev. But the people in their consciousness actually connected the economic crisis with perestroika, with the reforms, and that's why Michael Gorbachev was considered as a bad guy. Boris Yeltsin gave a lot of freedoms to our people. Boris Yeltsin created free mass media. He was the one to create private property. Boris Yeltsin created market economy. It was then when we got the parliament, the constitution, 
federalism, local authorities and governance, but uh, people just blaming him. Why? Because in 1990s we had an economic crisis. Why there was an economic crisis in 1990s? Because we had somehow to deal with the old obsolete Soviet economy with its huge factories and to rebuild that into the market economy. The crisis was inevitable, but the people say that we lived poorly because of Gorbachev, because of Yeltsin, because of democracy and because of perestroika. Now what happened when Mr. Putin came to power? <coughs> As I've already said, the economy started growing end of 1998, when Mr. Putin was not yet the prime minister, so the economy was already growing. He came to power as a president when the economy was already on the rise. At the same time, simultaneously with the economic rise and growth, the oil prices grew. When he became president, the petroleum prices were $20 per barrel in 1998. It was $140 per barrel. So the price grew seven times, and the public revenues also grew, the pensions grew, the salaries grew. When he became president, the average wage was $100 a month. In 2013, it was already $900 per month, nine times. And within the same period, within the same decade, Mr. Putin actually took control of the TV channels, arrested oligarchs, cancelled the elections of governors, prosecuted the opposition. But people lived better with every year on then they said, that's great. If under democracy we lived very poorly and under authoritarianism we are living better, so long live authoritarianism, long live strong hand, long live Mr. Putin. Meanwhile, while the economics are going up and things are getting better, uh, other things are happening on the outside. NATO moving in, the Baltic states changing. EU coming this direction, uh, the color revolutions, uh, uh, rose and orange, uh, and it and 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 there's a feeling from Mr. Putin, apparently, that this is American hegemony, Americans coming in, Americans pressing on him, uh, disrespecting the borders of Russia. Is that what is happening in 03, 04, 05, 06? Absolutely. He perceives that the United States is moving to the east and uh, NATO is expanded to the east. And uh, this is what happens, really. This is what really happens in reality. And it should be said that the West and the United States certainly bear a lot of, a big part of the guilt, of the blame for what happened to Russia, that we have this kind of confrontation. At the time, Ronald Reagan was prepared to integrate the Soviet Union under Gorbachev into the Western structures, Ronald Reagan strategically realized that there is a window of opportunity that former evil empire, former Soviet Union is integrated into the Soviet structure. But everything changed when Bush the senior came to power. In 1992, he changed the American strategy dramatically. Ronald Reagan was prepared to see the organization uh, of NATO as something to include Russia, and he was ready to help the Soviet Union 
uh, the moment of the crisis, uh, George Bush and um, his aides, neocons, and you know them were well, uh, shall pursue the different strategy that the winner gets everything. And this is under the presidency of uh, Bush, and that's when the eastward expansion started. This is when a decision was taken that uh, NATO should uh, remain as the main skeleton, as the main foundation, that uh, NATO should in include uh, more Eastern European countries, and the same rationale was uh, pursued by Bill Clinton, and uh, the bombardment and shelling of Yugoslavia in the 1990s was the key point when authoritarian country, but a peaceful one, was bombed by NATO without the agreement of the Security Council of the United Nations. I do think that this was a key mistake, and uh, Gorbachev, when the petroleum prices fell, he asked Ronald Reagan, and Yeltsin asked Mr. Bush to help Russia economically. There was a very bad cycle when the oil prices were down, and they could help us, and uh, this could lay the foundation for a single, for a unified security system, could lay the foundation for cooperation, but instead the West actually was very egoistic. No Marshall Plan was developed for Russia, no help, no aid for Russia, eastward movement, movement to the east, and I was the member of the parliament for many years by that time, and I remember clearly that Russia still had a very big uh, foreign debt inherited from the Soviet Union, more than 100 billion US dollars. And Russia asked at least to write off half of this debt, because it was very hard for us, so we had no money. The West wrote off almost the whole debt for Poland. The West is uh, writing off the debt of Greece, but when Russia asked to help it and to ease this burden, Zero. Not a single penny was written off. And Russia, which was uh, lying in poverty, destroyed, was made pay all these 100 billion dollars. That's why. Uh, there is some justification to Mr. Putin's position. He says, you didn't help us when the situation was dire for us. You didn't want to integrate us into common structures. You were egotistic. You decided to conquer, to seize everything. That's why in his picture of the world, this is a cynical, real politique, Pursued by the West, he absolutely mistrusts the West because he believes that the West betrayed Russia many times and cheated on Russia many times. And he makes a practical conclusion. We need more nukes, more weapons, more defense spending and more aggressive policy, the foreign one, in that sense. NATO forces would be stationed there, so he has his rational. And let me repeat it again. This is the West which has to be blamed for what happened to Russia, with Russia, and uh, for the system which has been set up in Russia. So, for a moment, I'd just like to talk a little bit about Beslan and, and what the meaning of that uh, uh, action was. It, it, did it have an international audience, or was it about uh, purely uh, anti-terrorist uh, action uh, for domestic consumption? I remember clearly the Beslan tragedy. In those days I was uh, actually a member of the Valdai Club. It was early September and suddenly it was a huge tragedy and the Russian experts, the American experts, the European experts, we all stood in front of the TV screens and we saw the tragedy in Beslan. We were crying. It was a big tragedy for all of us. And Putin then, after Beslan, reacted with two things. First, he screwed not, so to say, toughened the situation in Russia, meaning that he cancelled the democratic elections of the governors, and this is after Beslan that he 
cancelled the uh, elections in the constituencies. So the system has become even more rigid. And secondly, he said that there are some forces in the world which want to destroy Russia. It was his speech pronounced immediately after the Beslan tragedy. I do think that he meant the United States and most likely he meant the West. He believes that the West played its role in both Chechen wars and that the West played its role in supporting terrorism. So, Beslan, uh, a United States role, a United States role in Georgia, a United States role in Ukraine at the time. Just, just at that moment, he goes to uh, Germany, uh, to Munich, and gives the famous Munich speech. Uh, what was the meaning of that speech to you? What, what, what was he saying? And how was it received here? Russia is home to very diverse people. We are a very sophisticated country, just like the United States. And different layers of the society received the Munich speech differently. I think that many people could be actually called uh, hawks or neocons. There are people who feel kind of nostalgia about the Soviet mighty. And these people received the Munich speech with admiration. Because in fact it was a declaration of a new Cold War against the West. It was a manifesto of the fight against the West. I'm a liberal. And I received this speech absolutely differently. I remember clearly the year 2007. I remember clearly that speech. I watched it uh, on TV and then I read the transcript of this speech and it was clear for me that we are entering a new age of confrontation with the West that we will see the struggle against each other, that this confrontation will take place on the post-Soviet territory. I mean Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, Georgia, the Baltic states. And it was clear for me at that time that this new confrontation will not bring anything good for our economy. It will not bring anything good for our people. Because we know from the history that any confrontation is rather costly. This new arms race and this new confrontation with the West, which was announced in the year 2007 in Munich, makes the life of our people much worse. So this Munich speech was very important in the sense that, in fact, it gave start to a new age of uh, foreign policy in Russia. What was he trying to do? I do think that this is how we reacted to the Western expansion. This was a decision taken to make the West stop at certain points. I remember clearly September 2013. I again participated in the International Valdai Discussion Club meeting and Mr. Putin came as usual. We had a meeting with him. There were kind of debates or discussions. And at that Valdai Club uh, meeting it was uh, 2013, six months prior to Maidan and six months prior to the Crimean events. At that Valdai Club meeting we had also Defense Minister Shoigu, Foreign Minister Lavrov, and President Putin. And by the way, Sergei Ivanov, who was then head of executive office, so the four main people of the country who are responsible for the foreign policy, 
security and defense. All the four people and I remember that clearly. I was just sitting in front of them and they were speaking and I asked questions and they responded, they answered the questions and all those four people just like kind of a mantra repeated the same thing. They said that if Ukraine signs the Association Act with the EU, if Ukraine tries to move to the West, if Ukraine signing those uh, agreements and treaties uh, neglects the interests of Russia, for us, they said, this is a red line. This is the red line. And I remember clearly what I thought at that time. I thought, wow, that sounds very serious. If Putin, Shoigu, Lavrov and Ivanov say that this is a red line, then it means that this is very serious. Two months afterwards, I was in Europe, in Stockholm. I had a very brief meeting with Karl Bildt. Karl Bildt. He was the then uh, the Sweden foreign minister, and he was the main man behind the agreement between Ukraine and the EU. And I told him, Karl. I have just returned from the Valde Club meeting and four people, Putin, Shoigu, Lavrov and Ivanov, kept saying that this association agreement would be a red line. And he said, oh, well, this is nonsense. nonsense, just nothing will happen, this is not serious. And I told him, this is very, very serious. You have to hear me that this is very serious. And he said, no, no, this is nonsense. Two months afterwards, Maidan took place in Kiev, civil war broke out, and then Crimea was annexed. Because, sir, actually, Putin perceived that as a red line. He said, okay, the West came to Estonia, Poland, to Slovakia and Bulgaria. But it cannot go further to the east. This is a red line. And when he saw that, what happened? He perceived the agreement between Kiev and Brussels as uh, the attempt to drag Ukraine into the Western alliances. This is how he reacted. In his View. National interests of Russia require that the neighboring countries, such as Belarus and Ukraine, at least, at least are neutral. This is what Kissinger suggested, and this is what Zizhinsky suggested. When the Ukrainian crisis broke out in January, 2014, Kissinger published his article and Zizinski published his article and they both said that the best solution is to extend certain warranties of neutrality and territorial integrity of Ukraine. And probably it could be a solution, but unfortunately, no one wants to listen to them, and what happened, happened. Uh, thank you. Good, good, thorough answer. Let's go backwards to 2008. Obama is president of the United States. Um, uh, Hillary Clinton is the secretary of state. There is a a thaw around Medvedev's, uh, uh, the switch with Putin, uh, and we call it the red, the uh, reset. Uh, what, what actually happened there? What was explain the thaw, the hope for the thaw, and and what is the reality of what was really going on? It 
was quite a good period of time. Looking back, I just think that it was a good period of time. And those four years when Mr. Medvedev was the president, really, it was a thought, not only in the relations between Russia and the West, but also within the country. It was easier in the country, meaning that the internet was freer, less political oppressions, more pluralism in the mass media. It was not bad time. I remember I met Mr. Obama in Moscow when he just uh, was elected and this was his first visit to Moscow and he worked all day long. He met the students and he had a very brief meeting with Mr. Gorbachev and then four hours he had tea uh, with Mr. Putin and his dacha and then he came back to Moscow and there was a meeting between uh, Obama and the Russian opposition and he told us that after awful terrible relations between George W. and Dick Cheney and Russia, he wants to absolutely new relations with Russia, more nonsense, more pragmatic, more cooperation, more trust, more mutual understanding. But at the same time, Barack Obama was a Democrat. And for Democrats, the values are very important. And for Barack Obama, such things as uh, human rights, democracy, are really very important. Um, also, the freedom of speech. And he met us with the representatives of the Russian opposition. And I remember that meeting, we were sitting in a hotel. It was uh, Ritz Carlton, Tverskaya Street, and he actually uh, was accommodated there along with his wife uh, and two his daughters, and he was very tired. He worked all day long, and our meeting was at 8 p.m., and a note was brought to him, a memo, and he read this note, and he broke out laughter, and he said, now what it is? We said, no, we absolutely don't know what that. And he said, my little daughters sent me a letter from the fifth floor. Daddy, just finished your conversations, we want to have some dinner. This was a kind of a small detail, but Obama met the Russian opposition, and next to me I had Mr. Nemtsov, and Obama said, yes, I want to establish good relations with Russia, good relations with uh, Mr. Putin, but at the same time, I will not keep silent uh, about the violations of democracy, freedoms and human rights in Russia. And I just think that this is what Mr. Putin disliked. Putin is ready for no nonsense agreements when we speak about uh, security, defense and economy. But he believes that no one is entitled to criticize him for his domestic policy. Well, I do think that this conflict between him and Obama took place because of that, for those reasons. And Barack Obama, just like Hillary Clinton, openly uh, were uh, criticizing when someone was prosecuted here, put in prison or Banned, and Putin was irritated with that, and this ended with what? In Vladivostok there was a meeting between Hillary Clinton and uh, Sergei Lavrov. I think it was IPEC meeting, summit meeting, and Lavrov said, all your NGOs, such as NDI, IRI, Fund for Democracy, they should just move away from Russia. 
and all the American NGOs were just thrown away from Russia and expelled from Russia. They abandoned Russia, just like Soros Fund was uh, expelled from Russia and it is forbidden in Russia, it is banned in Russia. So in fact, all the American organizations are forbidden in Russia. And this happened under Obama and this happened under Hillary Clinton. So that's why the reset failed. The, the switch back happens. Putin and Medvedev announce, well, Putin's going to be president again. Uh, and there's quite a reaction to it. Uh, it's really, in some ways, the first time social media really enters a process as well in reaction, I guess, to it. Uh, talk about that a little bit uh, for me, will you, with the, the switch, the reaction to the switch and social media's role in that? I participated in that directly. Together with Boris Nemtsov and other opposition members was an organizer of those rallies, the one at Bolotnaya, the one at Sakharov Avenue, Novi Arbat, I was actually one of the moderators of those rallies, one of the leaders, and it was a surprising thing. And it was an unexpected thing for us. Just a year before, when we actually held certain protests, we gathered no more than 1,000 or maximum 3,000 people. And in December 2011, we saw 120,000 people gathered. We were astonished. How this may be explained? I do think there were two reasons for that. The first reason was that Medvedev gave us some hope. When he was the president, his rhetoric was very inspiring. He said, freedom is better than lack of freedom. Nice words. I do think that Lincoln himself would sign such, actually, an act, such a statement. And he said that Russia needs modernization. And modernization, actually, was his main motto. He said that Russia needs four eyes, innovations, investments, infrastructure, and institutes or institutions. Great, sounds great. There was some help that step by step, gradually, the country will do more reforms, becoming more transparent, more open, more modern, more modernized, upgraded. And all of a sudden, Putin comes for and says, as Schwarzenegger, I am back. And certainly it was a total shock for everyone, for us. And a big deal of people didn't want Putin to come back. Because the people realized that if Putin comes back, there will be no modernization, there will be no freedom, no reforms. And this is what really happened. After he came back, the whole modernization was stopped. And the second reason, there was an economic crisis. You may remember that it started with the Lemon Brothers. It started with the Wall Street in New York. The world financial crisis took place, followed by an economic crisis, and Russia suffered from that too, got affected. In 2009, the Russian GDP fell by 9%. The people's income fell, and these things put together 
the decision of Putin to come back, the disappointment, the economic crisis, and mass um, rigging at the elections in the election in the elections, there were thousands of uh, videos uh, from the polling station showing how the minutes were written that people were made vote for the party in power this resulted in the indignation and people started going in the streets and to demanding the reforms but unfortunately unfortunately at that time we failed to implement our requests. Putin got back in May 2012, oppressions and repressions followed. The society got disappointed with what was happening and we failed actually to obtain those reforms. The social media certainly they played this role, a big role, because um, mass media disseminated information about falsifications and riggings and Facebook played a certain role, a big role, and YouTube played a big role. Because the people came to the polling stations, they saw riggings, and they took out their smartphones, they recorded everything and immediately uploaded that on the internet and the whole country could see that. So social media played a big role in those protests. And the social media was something that was not uh, presumably uh, in uh, in uh, President Putin's uh, uh, toolkit. He wasn't ready for it to to come. Probably surprised by it all. And I know. And I do you think that's true? Absolutely. I totally agree with you. Not only Mr. Putin, but also us, uh, the representatives of the opposition, could not expect this effect from the social media. This was a total surprise. We saw for the first time that uh, YouTube and uh, Facebook could bring together millions of people. It was a surprising thing. Then the Arab Spring followed after those events, as you know, when the whole world saw that the social media can bring millions of people in the streets of Cairo, for instance, or in the streets of Istanbul. But uh, December 2011 in Russia was the first case in the world when the social media played such an important role. And if you're Putin, from what I understand about him, uh, he does not believe in spontaneous combustion of a population. He believes uh, Americans in AID, USAID, or, or the Secretary of State talking on, uh, on, uh, on YouTube and, and social media encouraging the crowds caused this, not whatever was actually happening in policy terms uh, that angered uh, Russian people. Uh, am I right about that? You're absolutely right. Vladimir Putin many times said, and he kept repeating that the protesters, that the people at the rallies in Moscow and in Kiev are backed by some external forces. He truly, genuinely believes that people will not just come into the street because of their beliefs and because of their values. Just like Nicolas Maduro, a Venezuelan president, nowadays says that uh, Caracas protests are masterminded by the Americans, that one million of Venezuela citizens who are coming in the streets. This is because of the United States. Erdogan in Istanbul, when one million people gather for a rally, he says that uh, this is because of Gulen, who is uh, 
now in the United States, and he actually demands the deportation of Aguil, and he wants him to be in prison, and he believes that it would be the end of the protests. These people do not understand that the reason of those protests is inside the country, that people are protesting not because the United States wants that, but because they want a different life. These leaders just do not understand it. I, as the organizer of the rallies uh, at Balotnaya Sakharov Avenue and uh, Novi Arbat, can even take an oath and say that there was no external influence exerted on us. We organized everything on our own, and people actually did that on their own. We did that because of our beliefs and our values, but unfortunately, Mr. Putin does not agree with that, and that's why after the mass protests of 2011-2012, when he got back to the Kremlin, some tough measures were taken. About 40 people were arrested and put in jail. These are the people who participated in the protests. And secondly, Russia First time in the history uh, adopted censorship in, on the internet. A department was set up which is called Roskomnadzor, the Russian Committee for the Oversight, which may any time, without any court ruling, following its own initiative to block any website, any blog, a video clip on the YouTube, and there are thousands of websites, thousands of blogs which have been blocked or banned by Roskomnadzor. Just to make it clear for the American audience, everyone knows uh, the great chess player Gary Kasparov. Gary Kasparov has his own media, which is called uh, Kasparov.ru. This is his internet newspaper, a small one. It's been banned in Russia since 2012. So meaning that you cannot read his blog in Russia. The same way, Alexei Navalny, uh, Navalny Live Journal was blocked. The same is true of online newspaper, daily journal, oh, journal. also granny newspaper was blocked online. Thousands of media, including democratic, liberal opposition ones, were censored and were blocked, and there is no access to them from Russia. So this is, a, this is the uh, culmination of a very different Putin than took over in 1999 by his, the beginning of his yeah. term in yeah. 2012, this is a very different man. Absolutely. 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 And, and, and in he has a very interesting article. In November 1999, sorry, December 1999, when he became acting president, and he said that uh, he is going to uh, run for president, his first elections. So he published his first article, which was called Russia in the World in the 21st Century. It is a very important article, because in essence, he explained his strategy. And the strategy is very interesting in the sense that, uh, on the one hand, there is a promise that uh, Russia would be a democratic country, it would be free, that he would grant the freedom of speech, human rights, constitutional guarantees. These things are all there, but at the same time, on the other hand, there is a different part of the article where he speaks about traditional values, about uh, the stack power or the vertical of power, about setting order to the country and about the rigid system. So it is in December 1999, his rhetoric uh, combined both parts. On the one hand, the democratic image of the country, which cropped out in early 1990s, 
and on the other hand, uh, traditional conservative values and traditional Russian power, which is not compatible with freedom and democracy. All those 17 years, we saw how the first part was dying out and the second part was blossoming. So there was a transition from one part to the other. And really, in 1990s, when Putin became president for the first time, it was the country certainly not truly democratic, not truly with market economy, but it was moving in that direction. And now, 17 years after, we have an authoritarian rule, we have mass violations of human rights. And this is a country which uh, has almost no market economy, because 65% of the GDP is uh, the public sector, 65% of the GDP. This is what the public sector accounts for. So this is not Belarus under Lukashenko. Under Lukashenko, uh, the public sector accounts for 85%, and Russia, the public sector accounts for 65% of GDP. But you may agree that uh, if uh, the state holds two-thirds of your economy, you would not say that you have a market economy. And under Yeltsin, the public sector accounted only for 25% of the GDP. So it means that the public sector grew almost more than two times, and it means that the state has more control over the economy, over the people who are working for the public sector. So you're absolutely right. Russia, which was seen now, is uh, dramatically different from the one from the country which we saw in 1999 when Putin became president. Do you think, uh, I mean, the world and certainly the president of the United States and uh, the former president of the United States and many legal officers in the United States believe that Russia uh, hacked the, uh, the DNC computers and, the, and uh, that the fake news was coming from troll factories in Russia, uh, that there may have been collusion between some members of Russia and some members of the Trump team. Uh, when you heard about all of that, uh, what do you think the implications are for Russia and Putin of the allegations about the, the hacking. Certainly I have no proof. Probably certain evidence would be obtained in the course of the investigation held by Congress and the Senate. But what I know for sure, the Russian Special services or secret services have certain departments which deal with cyber security and there are certain units which may hack certain internet resources or websites. And again, in Russia we have hundreds of cases of the mailboxes being hacked. Nemtsov's mailbox was hacked, Navalny's uh, mailbox was hacked, Surkov's box was hacked. Three days ago, uh, Shaltai Baltai, uh, a hacker's group was uh, put in prison and it was hacking the mailboxes of the high-profile, high-ranking officials. Secondly, I know that in Russia we have troll factories meaning special companies which are hiring people who are actually disseminating fake news in, on the internet. There is such a troll factory in Moscow and somewhere near St. Petersburg. And thirdly, which I'm also very sure of, when uh, there was a presidential campaign in the United States and I kept track of uh, the Russian media content, what was said on the public TV channels, what was said by the Russian media. The Russian establishment and the Russian propaganda certainly uh, opted for Donald Trump, sympathized with Donald Trump. 
Uh, they openly supported Donald Trump. It was said that he loves Russia, that he loves Putin, that he would be an excellent partner, and Hillary is a bad woman because she used to work with Barack Obama, and um, she actually was uh, the one who uh, organized Maidan, who was uh, masterminding the color revolutions, and she didn't help Russia. So it was black and white picture. Very good Trump and very bad Hillary. And there was an open support for Donald Trump. And an astonishing, most illustrative example, when this uh, night of elections uh, uh, took place and when the whole world was watching what was going on in Arkansas and uh, uh, New Hampshire and uh, when it became obvious that Donald Trump won the same day, the Russian State Duma, all the MPs uh, actually applauded to Trump's victory standing. Can you imagine that the Russian parliament in a situation when we have a confrontation with the United States, in the situation when we are under sanctions, would applaud standing to the victory of one of the candidates in the American elections. I don't think that uh, no further proof is needed, no further evidence is needed in order to understand who the Kremlin supported and who the Russian establishment supported. And, and in what ways, when you think about it, are Trump and Putin similar? What is the affinity between these two men? I don't think that uh, Putin kind of likes Trump because uh, he looks very much like him. Trump used to say that no one needs NATO. And Putin says that no one needs NATO. Trump used to say that he doesn't need a unified Europe. And Putin doesn't need it either. Trump said that he hates free media. And Putin cannot stand them. Trump, Trump says that you need protectionism and walls. And Putin believes that uh, we need protectionism and walls. Trump says that uh, they need censorship in the media. And Putin says, I'm doing that already. I'm practicing that for many years. Trump says, business is what matters. Real deal is what matters, and values are only second to that. Freedoms and human rights are second to that. And uh, Putin says, you're an utter guy, utter boy. I also believe that uh, values are about blah, 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 and we have to do real business. And the final thing, during his election campaign, Trump said that he admired Putin. This is the exact quote. He said that Putin does a lot of things right. And how could Putin react to those things? Suddenly he was uh, very glad to hear that. And I do think that uh, Putin now is very much disappointed. He expected a different thing. He probably thought that uh, the very first person to meet for Trump would be Mr. Putin. And actually it turned out that Putin was the last last man, the last person uh, Trump wanted to meet. Putin expected uh, Trump to understand his position in Syria, in Donbass, and in Crimea. Nothing like that happened. He expected uh, Donald Trump lift the sanctions, and we see that most likely Trump would finally sign the new law on sanctions uh, approved by the Senate and the Congress. So I do think that Moscow is disappointed with Trump. Before the elections, a lot of people said that uh, Trump is our guy. Now many people say, that, no, Trump is not our guy.